That seems to work. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Perfect. I'm happy to be in front of you today. Uh, we're going to talk about Leap Camera. And I have a very short kind of 130 slides to go through in less than 40 minutes. Um, so let's, let's start the run. Uh, <coughs> let's assume that we want to support an ISP on an amazing new platform that just, just got released. Right? It's a great new SOC. Um, it has the best cam camera hardware ever, uh, obviously. And uh, you're bound to announce that to the world, or you just have. And <coughs> this, this new board that you want to talk about, uh, if you followed my presentation in, uh, at ELC in, uh, in Prague earlier this year, uh, who was there actually? Who has seen the presentation or the, or the video maybe? Okay, so quite a few people in the room. Um, but I assume the other of you uh, don't know what, uh, what we are talking about. So this brand new system was called the Broccoli Pie, right? Because that's a great name. We're really good at marketing. This is something that children will love. And you want to have, uh, you want to go a good up, be a good upstream citizen. You want to have a full, fully open camera stack for your platform. You want to have open camera drivers. You want to do upstream. In Prague, we focus on how you should handle that on the kernel side, what, how you should develop your kernel drivers, how you should integrate your port in, uh, in Leap Camera. Uh, we'll get back to that. Uh, but we didn't cover, actually, how to control the ISP itself. So this talk is kind of the continuation. Uh, of what we, we talked about in Prague. And for those of you who, who are not there and who didn't follow, uh, who didn't watch the video afterwards, don't worry about that. Uh, I won't do a full recap because otherwise I think we'll still be here tomorrow. Um, but I would like to know first who doesn't know about Leap Camera, who has never heard of that. Okay, that's fairly, fairly surprised. Uh, all right. Is anybody in the room who thinks they will learn something from me today, or can we just stop and go for the break? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> right. So <clears throat> there's lots of resources available online, lots of people who have given presentations uh, on how to handle uh, the kernel side, how to do sensor drivers, how to do ISP drivers, uh, how to upstream them, and I really, uh, <coughs> I really recommend watching uh, all, the, all, those gr all those great resources. So let's assume that you've, you've done your homework there, you've upstreamed drivers, or you've published drivers that you uh, use the v to API. Uh, you're obviously using the right upstream uh, APIs to, uh, to expose your hardware to user space. Uh, that's video for Linux, which I assume you've probably heard about as a media control API, probably you may have heard of. Um, but actually, hardware is fairly complex because it's brand new, it's very powerful. Um, you were very scared of that complexity and the bitter taste that it could really give to people when they would try to write applications that have to interface with that. But thanks to all the resources that uh, are at your disposal, thanks to the, the, the presentations you've watched, you know that actually embedded cameras uh, are difficult at a hardware level, but we, we can help with that. And you've decided to use the Leap Camera stack to uh, offer great support for your hardware to your customers. So, you know what Leap Camera is. Uh, I won't dive into details, so you already know how it's structured. You already know that it handles device, uh, the, the camera device, that it enumerates the camera devices in your system, that it will expose them to applications. Uh, you know that Leap Camera exposes multiple streams for cameras, so you can capture multiple resolutions, multiple pixel formats from the same camera at the same time, uh, sending some to the screen, doing video encoding, doing processing. So all that is something that, uh, that is covered. Uh, you know that it has advanced capabilities, that you can actually control all the settings per frame, uh, that you, can, uh, you have very fine-grained control of all your capture parameters. Um, but now we're going to focus on the ISP side. So this is something that is not exposed by Leap Camera to applications. The goal of Leap Camera is to simplify this for, for the application developer. But you, as a platform integrator, as an associate vendor, you need to deal with the ISP. Who knows how an ISP works, who doesn't know how an ISP works, or who doesn't even know what an ISP is? Okay, a few hands in the room. So ISP stands for Image Signal Processor. That's a piece of hardware that is specialized in processing images for cameras. So what does it do? Well, obviously, we 
have a camera system, so we start with a camera sensor. Um, and a camera sensor is really, at a physical level, a big array of photodiodes uh, with micro lenses on, on top of them. Uh, all of them are covered with, um, it's going to be the next line actually, a tiny filter uh, that's colored green, red, or blue. That's how you uh, actually get colors from your from images. The sensor itself is not directly uh, sensitive to different colors. Uh, so you have to put those tiny filters in front of each pixel. Uh, and yes, you have this, uh, this array of pixels at the hardware level. Uh, the hardware will sample that for you, uh, and you get digital values out of it. So that's really the gist of it. Um, so mention that you have those uh, tiny, tiny uh, filters, colored fi filters in front of your pixels, which means that the image that you get, assuming uh, the original is on the top left, will actually look like something on the top right. So, Remember, I said that the sensor itself is not sensitive to different colors, so that means that each pixel will give you a value. So if you look at those values, uh, grayscale, uh, you get something that has this uh, the check mark pattern because some of the pixels having a red filter will be very light uh, for a red object, but very dark for a blue or green object, for instance. So <coughs> that means that when you get this raw image out of your sensor, there's lots of processing to be done before it can be useful either for a machine or even worse for human. Um, turns out that humans are way more picky when it comes to what we want out of a picture uh, to, uh, to consider the picture looks good enough. So you have to uh, kind of color code your pixels. Uh, you have to then do interpolation between them to recover the missing color channels for, for all of those pixels. And you get something that uh, then looks better and gives you more information that can be, uh, that can be consumed by algorithms or by humans. Turns out that is way more than that to do because the, the sensors nowadays, they're actually fairly bad. I mean, the quality that you get out of a sensor itself, you have lots of dead pixels, you have different uh, types of noise that you have in your system. So the raw data that you get out of it is, is not something great. That's why we do have ISPs that will help processing the image and correcting lots of defects. I'm mentioning here uh, something called the lens shading, uh, which may have seen if you a bit into photography. Uh, that's also called a vignetting effect. You have darker corners on your image due to four different physical effects. Uh, all things that are not really desirable uh, effects. So the, the whole processing pipeline, I mean, this is a fairly simple version of, uh, of what you actually have in an ISP. Uh, it's modeled more or less at the hardware level, or at least when it comes to what the firmware exposes to, uh, to, to Linux, uh, it's modeled more or less as a fixed function pipeline. Um, so if you know a bit about GPUs, we've transitioned from fixed function to shaders a long time ago. There are ISPs that have programmable components, but more or less they're exposed still as a fi fixed function pipeline. So there's lots of, uh, lots of things to do in there. And even if you do all that processing, the problem is that the more processing steps you have, the more parameters you need to, uh, to set on the ISP to make sure that the, the image will look right. Um, you don't want it to be too dark, you don't want it to be too light. You probably all know what 3A in means, auto exposure, auto white balance, auto focus. It's actually way more than that. You need to adapt your lens shading, your denoising, uh, and, and, and lots of parameters. We're talking about hardware that consumes thousands of parameters uh, that have to be adapted at runtime for each frame. Uh, and that's something that an application obviously can't do by itself. So that's why we have those algorithms. Uh, and I'm not talking about the image processing itself. Uh, but code that's run on the CPU that will consume statistics computed on the image uh, and will compute then at runtime with those algorithms values that are fed back to the hardware to configure your sensor, to configure your ISP and control all those parameters. Uh, this tuning that needs to be done for that as well, we'll get back to it uh, towards the end of the talk. So, uh, very quickly, because this is about how to support a new ISP inside Lip Camera, I'll guide you through the lip camera source tree. So if you want to look at lip camera, you'll know actually uh, where you are. Uh, I don't expect you to remember any of this at the end of this talk, but that's for reference mostly. Uh, so we have a relatively big uh, code base. It looks really nice and shiny when you put colors in the, uh, on it. Um, and the project structure has, well, we do have documentation in source code. This is written in C++, by the way. So I'm sorry for all the rest lovers. Uh, we started the project about five years ago. Maybe we would reconsider today. Maybe not, depending on who you ask. Um, but uh, we have an include directory at the top level where you may want to look for all the public API and the uh, internal API. Uh, there's a 
source directory uh, where we have uh, different components, the core flip camera, but we do have a GStream element on top. We have an Android adaptation layer to expose the Android uh, application, uh, the Android uh, camera HAL API on Android platforms. Uh, we have utilities in there. Uh, and quite importantly, in the source directory, source lib camera pipeline, we have what we call the pipeline handlers. That's a term that I expect most of you will not be familiar with. That's the part in lib camera that handles the plumbing. So it's about making sure that the different pieces of hardware that you need to process your, your image stream from the camera will be connected together uh, in the correct way. That you're going to capture image buffers with the raw frames, that you're going to pass them to the ISP for processing, DQ the buffer on the other side, and really handle all the plumbing. So it's not about image processing at all. Uh, it's, about, uh, it's about connecting the pieces together. And that is one of the two parts that is platform specific in Leap Camera. So that's why the directories that you see there have platform names. Uh, but you've done the homework on that side. You have a pipeline handler for your platform. If you don't, watch the video of my talk from, uh, from ELC this year. Um, what we talk about today is still in the source directory, a uh, directory called IPA. Um, if you're into beers, uh, you'll be disappointed. This stands for Image Processing Algorithms. Sorry. Uh, again, that's a second component that is platform specific in Lib Camera. So it also has platform names, and it matches the pipeline handles. Uh, so how do we control this ISP? Well, you know about the Leap Camera stack and the architecture. Uh, the, the components that uh, we look at today are towards the top, uh, the green side on the right, the pink-ish side on the left. So on the right-hand side, you have your pipeline handler handling the, plumb the, the plumbing. On the left-hand side, you do have your IPA module, your image processing algorithm modules, that's a piece of code that will run on the CPU in user space and compute all those parameters. This is the only component in Leap Camera, by the way, that is allowed to be closed source. We do not encourage that, but we have recognized early on in the project that most vendors will not want to open source their own code. We want to make sure that the community will be able to write open source implementations. So the pipeline handler has to be open, the kernel drivers have to be there, the API of the kernel drivers has to be documented. Uh, so it's possible to use it, uh, but we do not force vendors to disclose their code for these algorithms. Multiple reasons. One of them, they don't want to and we can't force them. The second one is that for those of you who have seen vendor code, we probably don't want to deal with it anyway. Um, so. <laughs> We do have open source implementation in Salib Camera, but you can have a, 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 a closed source component. For the purpose of this talk today, I assume that you will want to, uh, to write an open source implementation because that's what we're actually developing here. So <coughs> what do we have there on that side? We do have a set pipeline handler, IPA module. They, uh, they talk to each other. Um, in the Lib Camera architecture, say the pipeline handler really uh, hand handles all the interfaces towards the kernel. That means that it's the component that will interface with the v 2 API, with the media control API, uh, and, and, and handle all that communication with kernel drivers, kernel devices. <coughs> this also means that when it comes to the image processing algorithms and the image processing algorithm uh, module, which consumes statistics and produces parameters, that module is not talking to the hardware at all. So you have your pipeline handler handling the communication with the hardware, and it has uh, an interface towards the IPA module to communicate with that. So we're talking in the IPA module just about the calculations. There's no hardware handling there. We calculate parameters. We get statistics from the pipeline handler. We calculate parameters. We send the, statistics, we send the parameters back. This component, uh, as I said, it can be uh, closed source. And due to requirements from some vendors, in particular Chrome OS here, they don't trust binary code from vendors. Uh, and I would assume that a majority of the people in this room wouldn't either. So they were very adamant that there should be a way to isolate that code. So when we have closed source IPA modules, they run in an isolated process. And that means that there's a mechanism to handle IPC between the two components. Leap Camera handles that for you. You don't have to write it yourself. Um, and from an IPA module point of view, from a pipeline handler point of view, this is completely transparent. So if your IPA module is open source, it's not going to be isolated, but it's going to run in a separate thread of execution or a separate process if it's isolated. 
So let's look at what we have in those IPA modules and I'll briefly talk about an element of the Leap Camera API towards applications because otherwise it's going to be completely impossible to understand the rest. And it's a concept of requests. Uh, request stands, it's a short for capture request. So that's an element in the Leap Camera API that allows you to tell Leap Camera that you want to capture a frame with a certain set of buffers, with a certain set of parameters. So an application will create a capture request then it will populate that capture request with values for controls. I want to have a particular exposure time because I want to control my exposure time manually. Uh, I want to make sure that autofocus will be enabled on that frame. I want to trigger the flash on this particular frame. And you also put buffers in there to tell the camera where to capture your images uh, and possibly multiple buffers if you want to capture multiple streams in multiple resolutions. So, so for each single frame you want to capture from the sensor, you have such a capture request. That's really a core element to the runtime API. So you create those requests, you queue them to the camera uh, as an application, and then sometimes later, the request will, will complete. And the camera will tell you, okay, that request has completed with those buffers and with those parameters that have been applied. And then you cycle through that, you possibly reuse the request, and, and you keep going at runtime. Um, so now that we've dealt with, uh, with the request, let's get back to the IPA module. As I said, ISP support. Uh, all the ASP parameters are computed in your image processing algorithm module. So how does that work? We do have documentation, the camera. Uh, it's possibly not the greatest, uh, but I think that it's fairly nice still. At least it does exist and it's quite extensive. So the first thing you do is that you, you read the IPA uh, writer's guide because we have a document that actually guides you through on how to write an IPA module. Um, that documentation is compiled to HTML, so it's easy to see in the browser. And now, fair warning, I'm going to show code. There's no error handling, mostly, because otherwise that would have been way too much code on the slides, uh, and that would just, uh, just confuse you. Uh, so if you want to actually write uh, an IPA module, don't do it this way. Make sure you have error handling. Uh, and don't focus too much on the code. Uh, because there's going to be quite a bit of it. I don't expect you to read everything. We will not read every single line of code. It's there for reference, and I will point the important concepts. So mental health warning, don't focus too much on the code. So I say it in C++, makes it even worse. It uses templates. It doesn't even compile. <laughs> right. Now that we're done with that, IPM modules in four easy steps. First one, the IPA interface. So what's the IPA interface? We saw that the IPA module communicates with the pipeline handler. So that's how we define the interface between those two components. What will be the function calls between the two? Um, for the purpose of isolating an IPA module, this needs to be somehow defined and somehow standardized. Um, this is the part, so Going back to, sorry. Uh, so on this one, uh, on every slide when I will show you on the bottom right corner a smaller version of this, we'll be looking at pipeline handler code. So things that handle the plumbing. For those of you who are not familiar with this kind of diagrams, this is automatically generated from the media control API uh, exposed by the kernel. Uh, it exposes the topology of your device. And then there are tools in user space that can generate a diagram like this that will show you what the kernel exposes. So bottom right, something looking like that, that's the plumbing. While if you have on the bottom right the red part, on the right side of the screen, that's the IPA module with the algorithms. So the goal of the game here is to make sure that the statistics that we capture in the pipeline handler will be passed to the IPA module. The IPA module will do its job and then send back ISP parameters that the pipeline handler will queue to the ISP. The IPA interface defines the operations to communicate between those two components. It's an interface that is specific to each platform. So we do not standardize it fully because different platforms have different architectures, different needs. But there are functions that we expect to be there in all cases. So typically the init function is something that has to be there all the time. There's going to be an init operation. And the start and stop functions have to be there as well. Uh, and we'll see a bit later why. This interface is defined not in C++, but in an ideal interface definition language. And we picked the Mojo 
uh, IDL, which, com from, which comes from Chrome OS. But we do not use Mojo and the Chrome OS IPC itself. We just selected the language of this IDL to define the interface. And that's then compiled. It generates C++ code behind the scenes for you. You don't have to deal, uh, to deal with that. But it has a set of, of functions that you see here. And then there's the counterpart of this interface, which is the event interface. So the previous one, the uh, IP interface is communication from the pipeline handler to the IP module, the forward direction. The event interface is the event that are generated by the IP modules when it wants to tell the pipeline handler that something has happened. Um, so, looking at the pipeline handler side of that, how do we use that API? How do we communicate with the, the IP module? Um, the pipeline handler first will create an IPA module. We have lots of helper classes in the camera. Uh, not going to dive in detail uh, on the API, but you start by using the IPA manager that loads all these IPA modules for you, uh, and you create an instance that will magically correspond to your pipeline handler to your platform. Once you have that instance and that object, um, you have to wire up the events to make sure that when your IPA module would signal something to the pipeline handler, there will be a function that will be called in response to that. And the way we do that, uh, if you're a bit familiar with, uh, with Qt in particular, and the signal and slot mechanism, uh, which does exist in other frameworks as well, uh, you connect signals, which are events, to functions uh, that are slots or receivers for those events. So we connect that, and we have to implement uh, in the pipeline handler the three functions on the right-hand side, uh, prime fill, send sensor controls, and metadata ready. Then let's quickly go through the, uh, the API we have there. I mentioned that the init function is something that's mandatory. Um, so Mojo is not C++, but it looks fairly similar. Uh, you have functions with parameters. Uh, the types should, uh, at least the standard type, should be familiar to you. Uh, and the function takes some parameters, input parameters, and can return values, and can return actually multiple values. Um, so that's what we see here. So, <coughs> In your IP module, once you have created, uh, in your, sorry, in the pipeline handler, or once you've created your IP module, you're going to initialize it. That's the first thing you do. And you have to pass it a set of parameters. Again, not going through everything, but one fairly important point. I mentioned that the, algor the algorithms have to be tuned for each particular platform. And so we need to pass tuning data to the pipeline handler. That's done at any time. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, passing tuning data to the, to the IP module. Done at, at uh, init time. The IP module is isolated, as I mentioned, doesn't have access to the kernel devices, but actually in some platforms it will not even have access to most of the file system. So we pass it uh, either file name or directly the data. That's up to you. You can decide how you pass those parameters. And in this particular case, we use the helpers we have in Leap Camera uh, that allow passing tuning data in YAML format. Um, but you're free to use anything you want. And so we call this init function, giving it the name of a tuning file, giving it the, the model of the sensor that you, you're running with, uh, giving it, in this particular case, the hardware revision of your ISP, because different revisions may have different parameters. Um, and this is an example of a YAML file, very simple tuning uh, YAML file. It usually is going to be way more data. Uh, but to show you a bit how it works, it lists different ISP algorithms and parameters for those. Um, second step here is configuring the IPA module. So in it once, uh, at the very beginning, when, uh, when you load the IPA module, configure, that's a counterpart of the camera configuration in Leap Camera, which is something that is done before you start capturing a frame, and that's where you tell Leap Camera, I want to capture two different streams, one in RGB in a smaller resolution that I'm going to send to my NPU, and one in, uh, in uh, YUV bigger resolution I'm going to send to the, stream, uh, to, the, to the screen, for instance. And so you have to inform the IPA module with a configure function of what is going to be captured, what resolutions, because the ISP configuration will depend on that. So again, in the pipeline handler, in its configure function, we call the configure function of the IPA module, passing its configuration parameters. It's fairly free form. You, your platform has specific configurations parameters for the ISP, so you pass whatever you need. You define those parameters in the Mojo file, and you pass them uh, in, the, in your C++ code. Then once it's configured, we have to start 
the IP module. And that's a very important function that has to be there because the start function is where we're going to spawn the, the process, uh, the isolated process, or we're going to start the new thread uh, in which the IP module will run. Uh, and stop, which is a counterpart of that, uh, obviously stops it. So that is mandatory to, uh, to implement. The parameters are free form, but it's mandatory to implement. <coughs> and so in the start function of your pipeline handler, called when application wants to start a camera, then you also start your IP module, passing in possibly parameters. From this point on, the IP module lives in a different context of execution, and everything will be asynchronous from that point on. So before that, all the codes we've seen in it configure start uh, in the start function. Uh, even if your IP module uh, lives in a different process of thread, and even if you have IPC, uh, LibCamera actually waits for the reply, uh, and you have a synchronous call. From now on, we don't want to block anything on the pipeline handler side. We, we at runtime, we're capturing frames, we're real-time sensitive, so we don't want to block. So all the calls you'll make from now on will send parameters to the IP module, but will not wait for a reply. And those, in this specific case, are those three functions that are marked async on the left-hand side to show that uh, those are asynchronous calls. Um, and again, depending on your platform, you have different needs, you have different types of calls, but this is a fairly common example. So what do we have? The first one being queue request. That's a counterpart of an application queuing a request to the pipeline handler. We've seen that's how application passes buffers and controls for particular frames. And quite obviously, if an application says that you want to enable or disable auto exposure, that's the kind of parameters that has to go to the IPA module. So we do queue the request to the IPA module with a value of all the controls for that frame. Again, asynchronous, so that function doesn't wait, but it poses the data that will be processed, then a separate process, separate thread. Um, next two, stats ready. Um, that's a function in your pipeline handler that is called when the statistics are ready, uh, and then you pass them to the IPA module on the other side. Done. The, um, the IPA module needs to know what parameters have been used actually to capture this particular frame at the sensor level, what exposure time, what, uh, what analog gain. Uh, this is fairly complicated. Uh, it could be the topic for a whole talk, actually, uh, so I won't dive into the details. But now that you've sent parameters on one side, well, the IPA module is ready to respond at some time, and will tell you uh, when it is ready to give you parameters for your SP, parameters for your sensor. Um, and so those are callbacks that we have wired just before. Uh, and when they're called, we just <coughs> implement there, for instance, when the IPA module gives us the parameters for the camera sensor, we just send them to the camera sensor. Um, that's the part that may be subject for a new talk in the future, actually. Uh, when the, uh, the IP module tells that the ISP parameters are ready, we push them to the v 2 device for the ISP. When it tells that metadata are ready for the frame, that it has computed the average luminance for the frame that we want to report to the application, we put that metadata back in the request so it will be given back to the application. Um, and that's really the life cycle on the pipeline handler side. On the IPA module side, well, it processes those statistics and computes parameters. Entry point, it's one function called IPA create that you need to have, and one structure that has information about the IPA module. So that's really the entry point, that's a public API of this dynamically loaded module. You implement it as a class that inherits from the interface class auto-generated, if you've paid attention, it's exactly the same function as in, in the Mojo file. That's kind of expected. And you have to implement those functions. So let's look at the algorithms themselves. The algorithms handle the processing part. So it's just math, really. So how hard can that be, right? It's just computation. Of course, th those operations need to be scheduled at the right time, uh, in the right order, uh, and for the right frame and it's actually real-time sensitive. So how hard can that be? Well, fortunately, LibCamera will help you there with a component called libIPA that helps developing those IPA modules. So very quickly, libIPA defines an interface, a standardized interface for each algorithm to implement with function that's similar to what you've seen before. Initialization time, once, to get the tuning data and do something with it, configure, before starting the stream, 
uh, queue requests, we've seen that, getting the controls from the application. Uh, prepare, which is run to prepare ISP parameters for the next frame. And process, to process the, the statistics. That's where the bulk of the computation is done. So that makes it much, much easier uh, to implement an IPA module. And so looking at algorithms, I'm going to show a very short and simple example of a black level correction. So usually the black level correction is about subtracting an offset from each pixel, uh, because pixel, pixels are actually black uh, in the frame due to different physical properties of the sensor have a level that is not zero. So we want to subtract that to make them actually completely black. Um, so we implement a class, black level correction, that inherits from the algorithm class. Uh, we don't have to implement all the operations, only the ones that are relevant. Um, so we, we're going to implement, and going back to the tuning file, you see that we have parameters for this BLC module. Uh, in the init function, we read them from the tuning data. This helps us to parse the YAML file. You don't have to do that yourself. You just get the data for the red, green, and blue channel. Uh, you get those values with defaults that are specified there. And you store them uh, into uh, fields that are specific to, uh, to your algorithm. Uh, you can use the logging infrastructure in Leap Camera to, be, uh, to, to help with the debugging. And then in the prepare function that prepares parameters for the ISP, well, you take those parameters uh, that you have taken from the, uh, the tuning file, and you store them in a structure that's specific to your driver that will be passed to the kernel. So that's kind of the interface. That's where the RPA module will deal with the API uh, of, uh, of, of your ISP. In this particular case, it only does that for the first frame because those parameters do not change at runtime, so we do it once at the beginning and never after. For a more complex algorithm, you would have more work to do for every frame. Uh, that's probably also the subject for, for a new talk in the future. And then the last thing you have to do at the end of your file is call this macro. Uh, you give it the class name, you give it a name that is the name of the alg algorithm uh, in the YAML file, and it will magically uh, register that algorithm somewhere. Then your IPA module, getting back to that, uh, there's another class in libipa called module. So you take the, your IPA module class that you implemented before, you inherit additionally from the module class, and then you have a new function you can call at any time, which is called create algorithm. Uh, you give that function uh, the YAML file, and then it will instantiate all the algorithms listed in that YAML file based on all the algorithms that are registered for the platform. So you don't have to do that manually. Uh, so very easy at initialization time. Same thing at configure time. You can then iterate over all the algorithms that have been registered in the system and call the configure function. Uh, when queuing a re request, you do the same. You iterate over, over them and pass them the, the parameters that are relevant. Uh, same thing for the, uh, the other callbacks, the other operations you have to implement the RPA module. So you just loop over all those algorithms and, uh, and you don't have to, uh, to do all the things, uh, all the tracking of the algorithms manually. That is how to implement support for an ISP in an RPA module with the pipeline headlock on the part. If you're interested in how you actually implement an algorithm that's like auto-exposure or auto-white balance, um, we could actually have a poll. What's the next conference most of you will attend? Uh, where I should go to explain that. <laughs> so probably next year around, well, OK, embedded recipes, perfect. 2024 embedded recipes. I haven't bought my way into having a talk confirmed for the conference, absolutely not. But thank you very much for your time. And any question? Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, hopefully, I'll get a chance to apply that to the winner ISP someday. Um, my question is about this um, um, calibration parameters for the sensors. So apparently, there is kind of no way around it if you want to achieve like nice, nice quality. Um, do you envision that in the future, um, Leap Camera might help actually um, uh, creating those parameters, like having maybe some sort of utility that you could use with a new sensor and have some kind of process, uh, like put it in a dark room, light with this kind of light, uh, put this color checker thing, and, and, and you know, to kind of um, be able to produce new uh, tuned values for new sensors that are not yet supported. Very good question. Uh, technically speaking, I don't envision that because we've already started. Um, so we have a skeleton tuning tool at the moment that handles uh, tuning, I think we only support, well, we have a, a tuning tool for Raspberry Pi which is one of the platforms supported in, uh, in Leap Camera. 
uh, bit of shameless advertising. You have probably heard that they have uh, announced yesterday the Raspberry Pi 5. Uh, and uh, the code for that on Leap Camera under the kernel will be posted in next few days. Uh, and the, uh, that code actually on the kernel side and, well, Leap Camera as well, is going to go upstream uh, as quickly as possible. So if you're concerned that Raspberry Pi, well, they may do things, but they never upstream their code, they don't care about the upstream community, uh, we're fixing that with Pi 5. Um, so kudos to them as well. Uh, but we have a tuning tool for them. Uh, we do have a skeleton tuning tool that works on the MX-10 Plus and the Ruxin platform that we, we support. Uh, and that at the moment supports only the lens shading correction. And we envision indeed that we're going to extend it in the not too distant future with the other algorithms. Uh, and uh, yes, so that means that uh, there would be a tuning procedure that would document how to do low-cost tuning. That's kind of adopting the Raspberry Pi approach. They want to make sure that if you have expensive tools to do that, and they can be really, really expensive, then yes, you can use them. Uh, but you want to make sure that you can also do tuning with a relatively low-cost setup. May not give you the best uh, results uh, completely, but something that's at least decent and acceptable. Thanks. Uh, regarding iris, I mean, like, uh iris control and lens control and zoom control, all of that can be implemented through uh, a live, live camera or that go in another library? Like, Yes, so that's something that is within the scope of lit camera. Uh, obviously, we need, again, kernel drivers to be able to control those elements. Uh, you need a VCM driver to control your lens or different things. Uh, but then that is something that uh, we do have uh, support for autofocus already on some platforms in lit camera. So we do control the, the focus lens. We don't have any platform today that has an optical zoom control, uh, just because on platform we've worked uh, directly on, well, that was not available at a hardware level, but it's definitely within the scope of lead camera. Uh, and so that's something, same thing as for, for the camera sensor. The pipeline handler will be responsible for communicating with the kernel device, and the IP module will be responsible for calculating the parameters uh, for, for the zoom lens, for, for the focus lens, for the flash as well, and all those uh, those extra devices that are around the camera sensor. Any other question? We do support digital zoom already, so that doesn't need, obviously, a, a zoom lens. Oh, that's going to be a tricky one. The Raspberry Pi 5 in the back, uh, running two cameras if anyone wants to see it. OK, that's an, that wasn't tricky. <laughs> I have, a, I have a request, not a question. Can you make a, you should make a YouTube playlist of all the videos you listed in the beginning and in the right order we should watch them to kind of catch up to the, to the latest saga. That's, that's actually resources we should put on the late camera website. Like that's a, a good like, idea. It'll be a Netflix series with chapter one, that. two, three. <laughs> yeah. I did already. <laughs> Is one mind back? Uh, are there ways to uh, get the exact time when a frame was captured or to control it? Yes, there are ways to get the exact time when the frame was captured. Uh, well, obviously, as exact as the hardware can provide. Um, so we can capture the timestamp that comes from the kernel, and we do expose that to applications. Uh, and then it's up to the kernel driver to decide how that, uh, that timestamp will, uh, uh, will be captured. Most drivers will just use the system time uh, when the, the DMA completes, but if you have support at a hardware level to generate an interrupt at the start of the frame, the driver can do that as well. Even better, if you have hardware support to give you a harder timestamp, that's something that the driver can expose to, uh, to leak camera and then expose to applications. Can you also control it? So to, to yeah, wait a bit uh, for the next frame to synchronize maybe multiple cameras? So you don't control it directly as in telling to leap camera I want to capture a frame at this time. What you can do, well, obviously you can have hardware triggers if you really want hardware synchronization, and then the frame will arrive when they arrive. Uh, so that's one thing. But if you do not have hardware trigger and still want to synchronize uh, multiple cameras, the way that's usually done is that you have your exposure time and your frame duration that give you, for instance, 30 FPS. 
So there's one uh, sensor that will run nominally at 30 FPS, will produce timestamps. The second one will do as well, but obviously the clocks are not synchronized. And so you will see that uh, it will slowly drift. And then you will compensate for the second sensors slightly reducing or expanding the duration of the frame to be able to, uh, to synchronize. But that's something that we expect applications to do if you want uh, synchronization at that level at the moment. In the future, we may implement it inside Lip Camera. One more. Uh, so with all the hype about AI-generated videography. Is security ever on your mind in terms of um, securely stamping? So like uh, Silicon Root of Trust talk, like Silicon Root of Trust authenticating like when something is taken at the time that uh, it was taken at based on, you know, GPS or something or something like that, like security-based stuff. So uh, this is not something that we implement today that is not really on our roadmap, but something we would consider. It depends a bit on how you can uh, actually uh, well, handle, uh, how, how you can well, timestamp those images and can uh, secure that information. Uh, because it's a question of root of trust as well. If you can't trust what comes from the physical sensor, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you distrust what, uh, if you think someone may tap into the MIPI bus between the camera sensor and the host, that's, there's nothing Leap Camera can do about that. Mm -hmm. So assuming that you have that problem covered all the way to where Leap Camera stands in user space, then if there are APIs at the kind of level, if there are hardware solutions to help with that, it's something we would implement in Leap Camera. But we've never really dealt with a platform that, uh, uh, that has to handle those use cases. Mostly when it comes to security, the use cases we've seen uh, is about capturing images that the CPU shouldn't be able to access. <coughs> uh, and so in that case, that's about allocating buffers in secure memory. Uh, those buffers will be processed exactly the same way, will go through Leap Camera, but Leap Camera uses statistics computed by the ISP. It doesn't really read the image itself, by default at least, uh, so the fact that the, the, the CPU wouldn't be able to access that CPU buffer wouldn't be a problem. Uh, so again, not implemented because we don't have a platform that uses that, but I think that would be fairly trivial. It's a, just about deciding where to uh, allocate the memory for that kind of use case. Okay, thank you, Laurent. Let's take, thank a, quick, you very much. Uh, let's take a break. <laughs>